This episode of the Blue Grip Podcast is sponsored by Saving a Hero's Place. Their gala is September 23rd in Biloxi, Mississippi. August 21st of 2021 is our first release. Ed Lujan, Misty Van Kieran, and then Misty became a co-host. Doing this podcast, it was the, the original design was to either motivate, inspire, educate, and I think you can learn a lot from people's failures if you just talk to them about it. Hey guys, we're back. Blue Grit Podcast, live in the studio with the sexiest man at Dallas Police Department. 110%. Clint McNear, your host, and Tyler Owen. Tyler Owen. What's going on, man? I don't know how you been. Good. How was your drive in this morning? It was beautiful. It was, in that Ford? It was beautiful in a Ford. Mm, smooth. Yeah. yeah. Like a Crown Vic. It wasn't like a Crown Vic. Yeah. It was a faster. I call bullshit, but whatever. <laughs> no, man, we got a we got a special guest. A uh, guy that I've grown to. Actually, my, my, my kid's a bigger fan probably than anybody out there. Joe King, the man, the myth, the legend. Welcome to the Blue Grit stage, brother. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of y'all's as well. Hey, hey, we share the we share the love. Share yeah. the love. So for our listeners, Joe, um, in their podcast is way bigger than ours, so you know theirs <laughs> yeah. if you stumbled on ours. Yeah. Um, Bridging the divide, Dallas ATO podcast. Joe's the host. Um, poster pinup guy at Dallas PD. He is our unit. We'll dive into all of that. Welcome, brother. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm a little upset that you didn't, you wouldn't let me do this shirtless. And you know, we can. I uh, we can only, out of, only <laughs> out of jealousy. <laughs> They'd either stare at your yeah. pecs or yeah. my gut the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully it would, it would, you know, take away from the void of personality. <laughs> so you know, and oh, that's God. what I'm hoping. It's my gut, and no personality. So, no, yeah. no, I'm the one, no personality. Uh, bullshit. Yeah. Some of the shit we talk about is pretty, pretty insane. So, uh. We always start in. Let's dive in. Tell us about Joe. Where'd you grow up? And uh, well, I grew up in Dallas in the Oak Cliff area, um, around Redbird Mall. Oh yeah. And at the time, I mean, I went to Bertie Alexander, a little elementary over there, and all of my family, uh, the Benavides family, they're over there in West Dallas. Some of them still stay over there. Um, at that time, it wasn't it wasn't that bad over there. Now, yeah, I mean, right. it's by Carter High School, and everybody in this area in Dallas area kind of knows Carter and their history. And oh, everybody in the state, knows yeah, it, if you're a football Carter, fan. Carter football. So, growing up over there, um, I had an uncle that was uh, he was a Cockrell Hill police officer, Pete Jones, and I always wanted to uh, I wanted to be that. That's I, I, the uniform, the badge, the gun. I just I wanted to. I wanted to get into that. How and young do you remember thinking that? I, I it had to been fourth, fifth grade. Okay, oh, wow. long I mean, it, time. Yeah, long time. And and Dallas PD. I mean, I was just seeing Dallas, uh, the squad car, and seeing the officers in the, in that patch and and and, and our badge. Uh, it's been the same patch and badge forever. Uh, I wanted to do it in Dallas because that's where I grew up. That's awesome. Did you ever run in and have any run in? Because I was always scared to do it. Whenever, well, number one, I probably couldn't get hired by the place I grew up at because I was, I was, that was an adolescent and just a fuck up. To be there with there you. was a time in my life. No, <laughs> no, I, I did have. I remember playing um, baseball out in the street on uh, close to uh, Keystone, uh, Glad, Gladstone over there in Oak Cliff. Yeah, my cousin Eddie and I were out there playing baseball, and we're just out there, and we kind of got off the street because we saw a squad car coming. And one of the officers got on the microphone and started doing like a play by play. It sounded like the intercom, <laughs> like uh, you know, like like a baseball game. And I thought that was the coolest shit. And yeah. I was like, man, I want to, I want to do something like that. And I don't know how old you are, but was that going to be seventies? No, I'm I'm twenty four. No, well, I was thinking, <laughs> no, like, I was thinking twenty seven, but I didn't no, want to offend yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I'm old enough to drink. No, that was in the seventies. Yeah, in in early eighties. It, the 70s, so Dad got hired in 67 at DPD. 60s and 70s, DPD was like iconic. I mean, it was legendary. Dallas PD, LAPD were like iconic. I mean, super respected. Like, if anybody in the nation wanted to be a cop, DPD and LAPD back then was, I mean, you were a god if you could get hired. Yeah, there. I think if you look at the states when you, especially back then, um, of course, it's changed now. But if you look at like you look at California, LAPD was a standard. You look it up northeast, 
NYPD. And then I think if you look at the state of Texas, Dallas was the standard, and that's, yeah. that's where – you know, it kind of uh, people gravitated to that. But. Well, and my probably because it was the, the size of it. They had their own academy, and they were the ones that set the standard on kind of what they wanted to be and, and who they were. And we had the Cowboys. And you I mean, you know, we had. I mean, we're Dallas Cowboys. Even though it was in Irving. Yeah, it was in A. We didn't talk about that. The <laughs> now, it's our, now it's our Arlington Cowboys. <laughs> yeah, that's but I think also with the history too, the Dallas police history when yep. it comes to, I mean, the Kennedy assassination and just uh, just Dallas PD has so much history that that's known nation nationwide. And then we have a TV show named after Dallas, you know, the, yep. the Ewings. I mean, right. so I just think that it's a, it's a natural popular hub. Yeah, I agree. So that's cool. And your uncle's at Cedar Hill? He was at Cedar Hill, Cedar. yes. Yep, yep. And no, Cockrell Hill. Cockrell, Cockrell Hill, Hill PD. And then, um, yeah, and their, ba- their actual uniform looks very similar uh, to Dallas PD back then. I don't know what it looks like now. A lot of them did, though, really. Yeah. The, the half, half moon patch. Yep. The buttons, I, the striping, the piping. Yeah, the cu- yeah, everything. Yeah. Because they set the standard. I mean, call it for what you want to, honestly. Yeah. So. so, grew up in Oak Cliff, was working at Chippendales. Was that prior to going to the academy or no, was that I, in high school? No, I just came from there. Just no. now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, what, as you navigated, you said really early on, looked up to police, kind of knew maybe that was the direction? No, I knew that I wanted to I wanted to get into law enforcement, and I wanted to do it in Dallas. But then I moved out to East Texas uh, from from the Dallas area out in little Quinlan, Texas, which was like night and day. I went from going from yeah. Sunset High School in Dallas, which no, was gang shit. central in the early 90s, yeah. and then I moved out to Quinlan, which was – I feel like I was out of the Dukes of Hazard, yeah. you know, area. But, um, down, 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 down. yeah, <laughs> yeah, the banjo <laughs> playing. <laughs> but, you didn't happen to be with a cousin or anything. No, 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 I'm not there. All right, well, that's uh, next episode. That's part two, the electric boogaloo. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's right. So, <laughs> so I go out there, and it's like I knew that I did not want to be an officer out there, you know, yeah. and, out, and, and out that far in the country. I knew I wanted to get back to Dallas and then uh, still be an officer. But then also Rockwell PD crossed my mind, too, uh, from high school and then growing up. And then I started going to school. And then, hell, I, I, you know, I worked at Terrell State Mental Hospital while I was going to school, which was a uh, – that's an episode in itself and Oof. depressing job. That, I mean, because it was fully oh, functioning back then. Yeah. But um, I think it prepared me to deal with people and deal with unpredictable people and – I mean, literally insane people and strong people. But it goes back to the point. Every single time that we've had somebody on, either it's an explorer that had interest, but the ones that really had the experience in the jail, Terrell State Hospital is not a jail, but it yeah. builds that foundation of communication. And I think if you have that foundation of communication, it makes every single person that I've known that had gotten to law enforcement that has that foundation of that aspect, yep. it makes them better cops, makes them better human beings. Yeah, you know, and, and, and it also – it gets you practice at being hyper vigilant. Yeah, I mean, really, because I mean, some of them, some of the folks in at the at the hospital, that we would be having conversation like you and I right now. The next minute, they're swinging. I mean, so you, you I learned hyper vigilance at a young age, yeah. early twenties, which you know, and then also you have to have so much structure in there and you have to have a lot of restraint, just like an officer has a lot of restraints because hell, we're human, we get pissed off like everybody. Yeah. You're sitting there talking to somebody that is. They try to stab you, you know, with a pen or something, right. you know, and then, you know, the the temper and everybody, everybody's got a temper and different buttons to push. You know, you got to learn restraint and as an officer, and then I had to learn it early on before I even came yeah. on. So I think it helped me. I had no idea you worked at Terrell State Hospital. Yeah. So to our listeners, Tony Godwin, Catfish Cops podcast. Great, Tony. Go listen to his episode on Joe's Bridging the Divide podcast. Uh, his side hustle, Tony does – trophies and he called me one day because i live in forney and said hey man do you think you could deliver some trophies for me for employee employee awards i said yeah dude let's drop them off the house okay so he drops them off so i don't know where i'm taking them so he sends me an address here's employee recognition awards for terrell state hospital <laughs> have you ever been by it yeah have you been into the grounds um i mean i did one time it but scared I don't talk the about it right snot now. out of me to go there that place well, for the listener, it is freaking scary. Yeah, for the listener to paint a little picture is that you drive in; it's like its own little city, and it's it was built in the early 1900s. It's that old 
cobblestone walls and gothic. If, if you saw that something. movie Shutter Island with uh, DiCaprio, that yes. it, it, the mental hospital there, that's what it reminds you of. Yeah, it is. It's eerie and creepy walking in there. And when I started working there, it was fully functioning. Now it's like probably only twenty percent active there as far as who they bring in and 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 it was a lockdown facility i mean you you'd have to walk up unlock the door come in quickly and turn around and lock it behind you and if you didn't somebody escapes then you know you're in deep shit and then you know honestly there was times when i'd open the door and people were trying to like get out as i was coming in to work was it just constant like scream or was it like was was it very cinematic of of what you see kind of on tv of it's constant yelling and just the Straight jacket. Outburst. <laughs> well, you know, so there, we use restraints, and they were straight jacket like they weren't right. straight jackets. And I let's say my job, if I had to ex- describe my job at the time, it was like in the movies you see the guys in like one fool or cuckoo nest, the guys in the white coat. Oh yeah, I didn't wear a white coat. I wore whatever I wanted to, but we pretty much did direct care with the with the clients, and also we had to drag them to the seclusion room. We had to restrain them, whether in their bed or restrain them in the seclusion room. Fight. Uh, break up fights between them and other clients, and then um, is that what you refer to him as his clients? Yeah, we refer to him as clients yeah. there. Yeah, and well, I uh, called Tony and I said, if Hannibal Lecter comes out, oh jeez, and oh, I have yeah. to stab him with one of your acrylic awards, <laughs> and I was wanting to leave him on the porch and ring the doorbell and run, <laughs> and he's like, no, you have to go in there and meet this guy and get him to him. I'm like, there's no way in hell I'm going in yeah. this freaking. It's building. a dude on a dolly with a mask on, <laughs> yeah. out, pulling out to you. Leatherface. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, you, but you know, another thing that, that I just thought of that when I was there, so basically we charted, like I worked the deep night, so I was up all night work, you know, and they, they most, for the most part, they slept. I can't imagine being on those grounds at dark. Dude, no, it, it, it's legit, it's legit scary. But one thing we did is chart the behavior of the clients. So when the doctor come in the next day, let's say a uh, client was combative, uh, you know, uh, threatening yeah. or whatever. The doctor would come in the next day and read the charts and also, oh, I'll hook you up with this, you know, and then a week later, that, 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 that aggression's gone. <laughs> so that helped me, I think, also get into a document, documenting oh, thing. So yeah. I, that I, you know, looking back at the wow. time, I didn't think about it, but, but I think that that probably helped me too with having a, you know, documenting and, cover an ass mentality yeah. and also the hypervigilant say so if i took away anything from working at that hospital other than gotten a bunch of wild ass stories you know it's that was a depressing job though oh, I can you're imagine. locked in there all day and all night and you know you that's that's what you have i mean not all day but your whole shift you're locked in there that's all you see it's you just know? mental mental health yeah I mean, yeah there was, i mean there was one guy that he had been there so i had i worked on the adolescent unit the geriatric unit which was very depressing the uh the forensic uh forensic or criminally insane unit the forensic unit Good Lord. that was that was a very eerie but one guy we my being on the deep nights the morning crew we had to get everybody up like at seven in the morning to make sure they're dressed for the morning crew so they can get their meds and then get their breakfast well, there's a lot of people pissed off, didn't want to get up at 6.45 and get dressed. So That sounds like firemen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just kidding. No, yeah. Just kidding. Well, but we're not kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love my firemen. So one guy, I go in there, and I give him his, his, a T-shirt. is a V-neck white T-shirt and a pair of uh, pajama pants to put on. That was, that was kind of the wear of the day. Next thing I know, he's walking out in the hallway, and he's got – the t-shirt on like pants and he's holding it around his waist cinched up and you know the neck hole it it wasn't covering much uh, and i had to usher him back to the yeah to the room to cover up sounds like a normal day at walmart yeah <laughs> it pretty much yeah. i swear i behaved whenever he took it back in there i promise yeah i almost wore that in today that's i thought was, uh, was uh, so how long did you do there how long were you working there almost three years Oh, wow. and then yeah. you just ill no. They decided to go ahead and just go dive off in a Dallas PD at that point, or go in the Dallas PD, and then I wanted to go to Southwest because I grew up that area, and then uh, go through our academy, Best of the Blue two five two. Shout out! I want you to I'm, yeah. Let's talk about your academy yeah. class because you 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 went to school with some pretty heavy hitters that were very much respected in the Dallas Police Department. Well, what year? Um, what year did you leave Terrell State? Graduate from Terrell State? I graduated from Terrell State at, um, <laughs> I, you know what's you know what's funny. So I was I was told I was going to start the academy in early December. Well, at the end of October, no, it was like 
middle of October, I gave my notice, and I left in October of 96. And I'm like, oh, I'll take, like, a month off, you know. And then they knocked the academy back. Oh. And I was like, holy shit. So, you know, and then there was talk that I may have to reapply and all this. So I'm uh, like, I don't have a job. And I was poor. I was just 22 years old. So I started the academy, though, in January 97. Okay. And But, yeah, I've had, you know, some – Chris Webb was in my academy, Scott McDonald, uh, God, I've I've got some Matt Edwards. He was a lieutenant. And he, now we have Lieutenant Hanley. He's over homicide. I mean, yeah. we've had some, we got some good people, and we I was lucky. Yeah. How big was your academy class? We started with forty two, and we graduated with thirty eight, which isn't too that's, bad. Yeah, that's, that's not, not bad, bad at all. No. What 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 prompted you, or what made you want to go southwest? Was it just because you grew up there? Because I knew the area geographically, and that and honestly, when when rookies get down the street, that's one of the biggest things is is not knowing where the hell you're going. Yeah. You don't know you're east from west, and you go to South. I mean, I started in South Dallas. I was on Deep Knots the, my first shift, and um, and it made sense. Actually, I was living out east anyway, so Southeast was closer to me. But when I got out to uh, Southeast and Deep Knots, I mean, none of the street lights worked. There, you couldn't read any letters or numbers on the damn on the houses, and you had to run everything on spotlight. And as a rookie, <laughs> I literally there was days that I it was like I was driving around a different country, like I was in Europe. So, right. for the listener to kind of understand, southeast, as far as Dallas is concerned, outline, that's, that's down to Hutchins, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, the, what are the boundaries, I guess, is what I'm trying to say? So, at the time, uh, we had Pleasant Grove, which is around C.F. Hawnish and, and Jim Miller. That's where the station was. But then we also covered Fair Park. You know, everybody, it, most people that are from Texas know where the state fair is, the Fair Park. <laughs> and I will say that Fair Park is one of the deadliest areas in Dallas, hands yeah. down. Yeah. And then we covered the Grove, and at the time, South Central wasn't open, so we went all the way over to Lancaster Road. Oh, wow. So the CF Hon, Lancaster Road, and all of that, and, and that geography out there is pretty spread out. So I would say the old Oak Cliff was a combination of the Grove and South Dallas combined. 100%. And, yeah. And, yeah. So the, the, and also the kind of clientele you would have as far as drug houses, but I would say most of the weight houses were out in, the, out in Oak Cliff. Yeah, big time. Mm-hmm. Damn. <clears throat> so you worked there for uh, you were in Southeast for how long? How, I mean, you spent primarily your career there, didn't you? I'll yeah, I uh, I spent from ninety seven August. I got a cabin in August of ninety seven, and I left Southeast mm-hmm. at um, I left Southeast in early twenty fifteen, and I went to the C- I was on the CRT for years there, and you know, crime response team. We just handled drug uh, street level drug complaints, and that's what I like to do. I started doing that from ninety seven. I literally did that from ninety seven to twenty fifteen. And then I went over and worked for then Sergeant Foy, now Chief Foy, over South Central CRT. And I did that for a year. And then I was just kind of, so from 1997 to 2016, October of 16, I left the streets and went to legal. Wow. How quick when you got out of the academy did you figure out your niche was dope? Like, I got out and thought mine was dope, and I couldn't find a roach in an ashtray to (laughs) save my life. (laughs) Well, I ended up getting into stolen car. I was always in chase with stolen cars, and but I couldn't find now. dope to save my life. You know, so I will I will say that I didn't have the most proactive trainers. I really didn't, and we have we have four phases of training. Um, none of them mess with dope. I got lucky, and when I got on Little T, I partnered up with my partner John Valdez, who was already already working with a with a long time veteran crew of dope chasers mike mata was part of that mike mike was only shout a few class yeah, shout out dpa president mike mata he was a few classes ahead of me so you know we all kind of came up and we learned from the old group that's who taught us how to do it and then as time went on a lot of them mike mata's left and pat Starr left and jaime castro's left and i was kind of like the oldest one left and my dumb ass did it way too <laughs> long and then i started I started kind of taking on that role of teaching. So it, I didn't find my niche until I got off training. And I, and it took me a while. There was days I, I was like, can I, damn, can I do this job? I, I was telling Kristen um, that I asked myself a lot, am, am I going to be able to do this job for a 20 plus year career? Yeah. But I think also by you not, by you having, I don't want to say shitty trainers because I, I don't, mm-hmm. don't want to implant, but, but I mean, by you not having somebody who's not involved with the training aspect, you recognize that to be a fault of yours because of their lacking and so did that prompt you to be a better trainer moving forward? Yeah, it probably did. But it also, I saw a lot of people that did it the wrong way going up and, and starting when chasing dope from, you know, on Little T in 97 with those with that group and then up until 2010. I mean, I, I had seen so many people 
get in trouble for this or this. And I saw also the cultural climate change yeah. in in the country and also in Dallas as far as perspectives and the way peace, police were viewed. You would go from not having any uh, dash cams to having dash cams to having an AVL, and then body cams start getting introduced. So I just kind of learned and because I saw all those little uh, levels of, you know, generations of, of policing and shit. Y'all know this. it Policing can change from one year to the next. Absolutely. Depending if, on what happens on, goes on in the country. That's yeah. the hardest thing that I've watched older guys do is refuse to accept that this career's freaking changing. I got hired in Garland in uh, 94, and Garland took care of business in 94. They, I mean, hey, it they was, still do, though. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it, may, it, was, it may be different, but yeah. they still do. It was salty. I mean, we, we, hand, we handle business. But as policing's changed, my academy started 31. We graduated, I think, 28 or 29. Um, but over the years, as it's changed, some of the guys from my academy and a couple before then, they started requiring a four-year degree. They started mandating a whole lot of things, all the cameras. And there's, I still have buddies that are like, screw this. I'm not changing. This is BS that we're changing. I'm like – you can either change you get with it, yeah. or they're going to show you out the door at some point or internal affairs is going to show you. And it's really hard to evolve and it's easy now. I've been gone 10 years, but when we got hired, you just went out and put bad guys in jail. And I joke, I kind of half ass joke now, you kind of have to be, have a associate's degree in IT to be a cop because you're driving a mobile server. You got more electronics crap on you than I know what to use now. I mean, you you got to half-ass dabble in IT to be in police now. And everything you do, you have to ask. It's kind of like being in the CIA. You have to assume at all times you're working under surveillance. Oh, yeah. Because you're being watched and recorded probably more often than you know. It's just totally changed. And you have to change with it or it's going to freaking eat you alive and spit you out. And one point out before my small brain forgets it. We talk on here a lot about leadership. I love the fact that you said... You learn from the dudes a couple of academies above you. And I, I saw a meme this morning, you don't have to have a title to be a leader or whatever. There's a whole lot of leaders that don't yeah. have lieutenant, captain, major, or chief. And you talked about Fred and Motto were a class or two ahead of you. And you didn't have you didn't have to have a sergeant or a lieutenant showing you what to do because you had squared away badass dudes a couple of years ahead of you. That's how it should be. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's been difficult for me at times because in Garland – if you call the supervisor, you better be dead or your police car is on fire. Otherwise, you call a senior officer, and if he doesn't know the answer, you find his another senior. You, you don't call a supervisor unless you're, you're dying or something. Mm-hmm. You don't. I, I think that's a lost art, that there's so much benefit from what, what we went through. Well, one thing that I noticed, and I re, I'm a really big believer, is that I think the younger officers today, they – they're under way more pressure and more scrutiny. I mean, yep. you just turn on the news, but but also I think there's such pride now that they don't want to ask a, a veteran officer. And I'm not saying that all yep. veteran officers are approachable, right? Yep. And they're willing to help. But what I saw is people that would just kind of do it and wing it and hope it works out. And I don't think in this profession, and especially in this day and it. age, you man. A wing of prayer is not the way. Not, or, not or you know, the older generation, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was way worse whenever y'all began, but the, the older guys, they're not going to front you out and make you feel like shit about doing it now. And I think that as, as we've evolved, as, as, with, as, as far as our profession is concerned, you have guys that have that, you know, that mindset of, you know, don't call me, don't bother me, I don't yeah. want to be bothered, uh, you know, and that's, that's just kind of the mindset of where our profession has led. Well, I think it's to the detriment of the of the profession if you have that. And and I always, you know, there are some people that that I've been around that think they're too good. To, are they? I'm not. I'm not. I, I don't get paid FTO pay, and they have that mindset. No, man. You, you know, help these guys out so they don't they don't fall. You don't want to see them making the news and making us all look bad. Because yep. if that happens, if they wing it and they screw up, they make a mistake and. It's we're all going to feel it. Yep. Yeah, look at look, you know in twenty ten we're feeling we're feeling stuff in downtown Dallas in the state of Texas from something that happened in Minnesota. Yep. I mean, so it it <laughs> you got to look at the bigger picture on things, and I I, I think that I, and I just I just wish what I've seen there at the end before I left the streets is that officers also need to 
you don't realize that you're a thirty year, a three year officer going on thirty year. You you know, because I saw a lot of that. Just say, well, you might be a hard charger compared to your classmate that's got three years on as well. Know that that not many of us are reinventing the wheel, and yeah. and there's other people that have done it, and also maybe have done it better, and 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 actually have failed. And I think you can learn a lot from people's failures if you just talk to them about it. You can learn yep. probably more, honestly. Oh from yeah. The failure. <laughs> I told my boys, and I said, I don't mean it cocky, but you don't lose, you learn. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. A lot but of truth. You, but you, you better learn, learn every time you lose. But you better learn yeah. because the night's going to catch up on you. Yeah, but you can whine and cry, oh, I lost, or I didn't. No, yeah. I learned a lot. Yeah. It sucked, but I learned a whole There's lot. There's a lot of value in defeat, man. It's well, speaking of Clint, talking about evolving, mm-hmm. you know, our profession really hadn't done a whole lot of, of, of good work as far as the mental health concern uh, the last 20 years, but I think we've been evolving probably the last – I've seen a huge improvement within the last five. Huge improvement. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. And I think that has a lot to do with the military, you know, us coming off of war and so forth. But you're a part of a, of a pretty unique group there at Dallas Police Department, uh, the OWL group. And if you want to kind of talk about your involvement with that and how you even got involved with, with having the passion for that, it might have been back to the, you know, the Terrell uh, mental health days uh, and, and seeing some interactions with, with clients back there to see how you can in, implement that into that you know, DPD. Yeah, um, I, I really think it starts with uh, being involved with the Sissy Officer Foundation because uh, we have a confidential counseling program yeah. that's been in that's been going since 2010, and ever since the July 7th attack, we've seen a 300 percent increase in officers utilizing that service. So mm-hmm. I was already I was getting involved with the ATO, and in um, and I know we're going to get to the podcast here in a bit, but so in 2021, I go to some I go to more mental health. Uh, conferences and I meet with Dr. T and first and their group and and I got the idea for the podcast to get messages out there to, to break stigmas to normalize conversations because I'm gonna throw a name at Dr. Gil Martin was the first time I had ever heard about uh, mental health in the law enforcement realm it just wasn't talked about and you know that I mean y'all know yeah, hell it's, yeah. it's it's hard to get it uh, especially older officers to talk about it now uh, but the Officer Wellness Longevity Unit, uh, it's the OWL, and we have a cool little act, cool little logo, patch and logo that uh, uh, Sergeant Allen Holmes made for us. And um, Chief Ramirez was tasked by Chief Garcia uh, about a year and a half ago, and he said, hey, I want you to start doing some focus groups and, and checking on our department's uh, temperature. Take it. See what's going on. What can we do better? We're having a lot of people that are going to IED. We're getting a lot of DWIs and, you know, arrest of officers and, and, and check and say, well, Ruben uh, Ramirez, he basically, he comes back and does a report and he got me involved because I already had the podcast going and he knew the message that I was already spreading. So I was already, I was already connected to in that, in that, that little world uh, of not only the mental health world, but also mental health when it come to cater and first responder. Yep. I didn't uh, know that was a chronology. I thought, yeah, I thought Al had started just prior to the podcast. Oh no, no, no! no I, I had the po- no, I had the podcast going in uh, August of twenty one, and it, but in the Al just started uh, uh, up and um, kind of twelve months ago, go right at a year ago. Huge shout out to Chief Eddie Garcia. If if the world had more Eddie Garcias, what somebody that walks the walk, talks the talk. Remembers he's an actual cop. Huge shout out to Chief yeah. Garcia. I've worked for seven police chiefs, inter, both interim and and uh, you know the main chief. He's the best that I've worked for. It says a lot. Yeah, I mean, it says yeah, a whole he, lot. He is. He, he's yeah. He's he's uh he saw a problem or he, you know, and then he got he got the right person getting Ruben to to look into it, and we just ran with it. I mean, we we picked the right people. Uh, we have a checkpoint model that um, basically. So I'll go back and say that most traditional peer support uh, peer support programs are. I train you two up, and it's volunteer. So they put out a casting call for who wants to be a peer supporter, and then you have some people raising their hand, coming, okay, come over here, we'll give you some training, and then you sit on the sideline and wait. And some of the people they pick. Maybe shouldn't should, they yeah. shouldn't be there. <laughs> That's right. And people aren't going to go to them, so they just kind of sit and wait. It's a reactive approach. The checkpoint model is basically taking handpicked people in your organization. In Dallas PD, we identified several uh, 
informal leaders through the department from that work in child abuse, SWAT, narcotics, homicide detectives, uh, known badasses uh, in, in, as FTOs and, and people that work the street, or some chiefs, actually, uh, Chief Schultz, she actually does checkpoints. So you identify your informal leaders throughout the department. And people that are liked, and people that are trusted, and they're, they're people of character. And, they, and they're also people, Matt Baines, people that have been in some hellacious uh, situations, and people know it. N- you know, not somebody that, you know, you don't want the department to know it all. It's somebody nobody likes, because nobody's going to go to them. Yeah. And so, or the department asshole. Let's just call it what yeah, it is. No, yeah, mean, that's, 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 there's plenty of them. There's yeah. plenty of department assholes. Yeah. Um, so you, basically, we get... Every critical incidents, we have it broken down into categories. Homicide, anything, any offense dealing with a child, uh, fatality accident, suicide, and then we have a other category that's like a critical incident. Let's say that y'all two answer a call, guy comes out, f- shoots at y'all, and then drops the gun. He misses y'all, take, take him into custody, doesn't make the news. Nobody hardly hears about it. But you two guys, damn near you lost your life, and you have to go home, and you have to process all that. And it, you struggle with it, and however you deal with it. Well, we get all the command staff emails of everything that happened. So we then break them up within our group. I say I have five check winners under me. I send Matt Baines, Kent Wolverton. I send all these different people, uh, Chena Schultz. I get. I send them a name and say, hey, here's the synopsis of the incident. Call them just to check on them see if they're okay. It means a lot to people. Yep. And actually, now that we're a little over a year in, we've contacted – over, I think, 1,800 officers. God. Some people we've had to contact more because they work in the shitty part of town, and they, they sadly go to a lot of trauma. And we, we check on them, and the numbers hover anywhere from 10 to 12% of the people that we've checked on in this past year uh, that have actually asked for a resource. And when I say a resource, it's like, hey, you know what? I would like to go talk to an ATO counselor. Or, I, yeah, you know, I'll try the city psych docs. Or, you know what? I'm okay on that on that suicide, but let me tell you this, my marriage is on the rocks or, you know, or something right, like right. that. It turns into something else. And the numbers we keep, we de-identify the numbers. We just, it's a, it's just a number, the shift, the type of call they went to, the watch they work, um, and the location they work Southeast and South Central, you can imagine that have a bunch because there's just a lot of bad shit that goes on. So we kind of keep those for statistical purposes, but the numbers for people that actually have said, you know what, I'll take you up on that. It's around ten to twelve percent. Wow, which is high. It is, yeah. Well, that's ten to twelve percent of the people that, if they weren't touched, yeah, probably wouldn't have reached out if yeah. they weren't proactively touched. Proactive. That's the key. You got to be proactive about it. Hell, Chief Ramirez just uh, he wrote that bill. It just got uh, just got passed in the uh, Texas legislature. That is it uh, thirty eight fifty eight? I believe. It, and it basically, is if a if an agency in Texas creates a wellness unit and a model like this then they could be incentivized to get grant money. So that just, that just I think, got signed by the governor. That's one. I think JW, we had John Workerson on, one of our yeah. government affairs guys. He was talking about a bill similar to that. Yeah, but it's a mental health. Number. But yeah, That's good. Mm-hmm. It's popular now to talk about we want to help people or we're thinking about helping people. I value y'all's model. I value the people that are involved in it. Because it's easy to build a program, and it's sexy, and it sounds great. but So one of the biggest stigmas for non-law enforcement listeners are, if I come forward and say, hey, Lieutenant Joe, I'm drinking too much. He's taking my badge, my gun, in the old style, right? the normal way. My badge is gone. My gun is gone. I'm on admin leave, maybe unpaid leave. I'm under IA investigation. They're probably starting a fitness for duty because I'm crazy. Or and if you don't have income coming in, you're probably going to face getting divorced. Yep. yep. Um, so there's no incentive to come forward, or even if it's not drinking. Um, you know, I'm screwed up. I haven't slept in three days, and I'm, you know, whatever. You're, there's a fitness for duty. Your badge. You're you're done. You're treated like you have terminal cancer. Career-wise, and, you are pretty much done in our, in the old days. Yep. And what they have done, um, if you come forward proactively and tell them I have an issue, you're going. They're going to take you and get you whatever help you will agree to go get. And even in the old days, if a department would approve you to go get assistance, when you came back, 
You were probably stuck somewhere hidden, like at the auto pound, Property signing road. in, right. yeah. signing in junk cars to be crushed or something. And under Chief Garcia, you agree to go get help. The day you return, you go right back to work. You go in the position you were in, and you start back to work because you don't have terminal cancer. You're not a screwed up POS. You have a you have a work injury. Right. You would you, you would do that somebody if you blew your knee out. Yeah. Yeah. If somebody if somebody fractured their foot and was out for six months, they don't come back and get assigned to the property room or treated like no. they are a, you know, they have this terminal issue. And I can't, I can't fathom the leadership he has to step off in that. Cause that's a first right. and that shaky ground. And if people are afraid to actually do the right thing and, and he's not even shy about it. I mean, he's tweeting, um, one of the officers uh, went and made a bracelet while he was there, came back, wanted to give it to Garcia for supporting him, Chief Garcia. Garcia didn't hide it. He starts tweeting about photos about the bracelet. I back my people. And, like, man, that makes me freaking yep. cry for, talking. For the listeners and viewer, this bracelet right here was made by Gordon Fulton. He, Gordon, it's, the sa- it's the same uh, bracelet that he made for Garcia. said it represents his life. It's awesome. Investing in your people. Dude, those people would freaking kill for. Her. Yeah, yeah. So, blue grit listeners, the what uh, Clint's talking about is so. It's ten months ago, Chief Garcia came up with an idea to we're going to give our employees, both civilian and sworn of Dallas PD, if you come forward before you have an alcohol related incident. I mean, don't get pulled over while you're behind the wheel drunk and say, "Oh, I got a problem," and then you're you're kind of covered. It's if you come forward and say, which is hard in itself, for somebody yep. coming forward yep. in this profession and saying, "I need help," and especially I need help with an al- a rehab. So if you come forward and and reach out for help, the city will give you thirty working days of a free leave, and the wellness unit will. We've got several locations vetted in the Metroplex, and even some like five hours away. We will help get you their transportation, and we'll help. We'll pick you, drop you off, pick you up, and you get paid. And also, the Assisi Officer Foundation has help with the financial burden of what's left over. The insurance doesn't pay. It's crazy. It, well, yeah. Awesome. So it, when Garcia brought it up, I was in the room, and I went, "That sounds that sounds interesting." I said, "If we have one in a calendar year, I think it'd be a success." Well, ten months into policy, we have we we have uh, eleven that have gone through, and they've gotten out. And just two weeks ago, two of them were promoted, and they have come forward. Not some of them, hey, it's, and they go right back to their other their assignment they left. And if they don't want to, we will make accommodations to help ease them back into their job. But there's you're not going to get buried at the auto pound. You're not going to go to the you – know, no offense to the auto pound and property room. But right, that, it, right, historically right. in our department, that's where yeah, it's punitive. you get – It's punitive. But um, that's where your communications, you're not going to get stuff in dispatch. Uh, everybody has gone back to their assignment that they left. I have two that have come on, on our podcast, Gordon and uh, now Lieutenant Andre Taylor of SWAT. He goes back to working in SWAT in the in the early two thousands, which is unheard of. Yeah, and young Gordon, mm-hmm. no offense, young Gordon, but him suffering what he was suffering that young in life, yeah, y'all probably truly saved his life because starting that young, he wouldn't have made it to forty or fifty years old. No. Well, the doctors actually had told, and and, and and Gordon is fine with it. Everybody else, we work on our confidentiality veil, but Gordon has come forward, and he actually has told his story. And great and it, episode, it's, yeah. God, it's it's it was so powerful. So he gets out the day he got out, or the day after he come, he got out. He met me down the wellness unit, and he says, "Hey, tell Chief Garcia he saved my life with this policy." And I was like, "Oh, you know." So and it was on a Friday, and the comp stats on a Friday, and I said, "You know what? I'm going to go up there and tell him right now." Wow, boy, and, that makes me freaking yeah. So I went up. I went up to Comstat, and I kind of waited at the end. And they had already been going. The time I got up there, Garcia's there, and all the chiefs are there, and all the underlings are there. And then at the end, and I said, "Hey, I have something from the wellness unit." And I told Chief that he got choked up. Sure. He came up to me after the fact and said, "Hey, no shit." I go, "Yeah," and he got choked up again. Well, like a week later, not even a week, he emailed me and said, "Hey, I know this is all in secret." If this, I would like to meet this guy if he's willing to do it. So set up the meeting, 
he goes and meets with Garcia and gives him gives Garcia the bracelet and I mean it the rest is kind of history and it in that and and it really um it mean it meant a lot because Garcia was texting me the day before Gordon got promoted to call his name. Damn, it's awesome. Yeah, and I know. Shout out to Warriors Heart. I was in Vegas mm-hmm. last week for National FOP Conference, and I got to spend a bunch of time with the Warriors Heart people, good people. But we were talking about the relapse percentage, the rough yeah. percentage. People that go because they're pissed or don't want to go or they're forced to go or a condition employment, I think they, they weren't incentivized to go there to begin with. Their hand was forced. The proactive approach, the openness – we love you, we support you, go get well, and come right back and step right back in your role. I'm not a clinician, so it's uh, it's a wag. Was that a wag? <coughs> Wild-ass guess? Yeah, yeah. wild-ass guess. Um, I bet the relapse percent because of the, the support, the 100% the hundred percent of support that you guys have, and it's, a, it's genuine, I would bet whatever the national average of relapse for people is, I bet y'all are well below that. If I had to guess, yeah. yeah well, I, that I think that goes back to the original mission of the of the unit in establishing a, well, a you culture. Be a freaking emotional wreck. <laughs> God bless. Yeah, yeah, listeners, you need to hear Clint, the great Clint McNear's episode on R as a man. It's good. Talk about <laughs> it's it's it. There's there's some emotional parts, but um, it, it's establishing a culture. That it's okay, it's and, and, and and it's not just a bumper sticker saying of it's okay not to be okay and break the stigma. I mean, no, it's real. We we're putting shit together that actually gets people to come forward and not think and not have the fear of my career is going to be done. Yeah, if, even if I go forward, I'm going to be buried somewhere, and then then I'm probably going to be under a microscope. Then I'm probably get railroaded out. I'm never going to promote. Yep. I'm never going to get a gig somewhere that I want to, and I'm going to be stuck somewhere. For That's the, how it used to be. For the listener, we, we had somebody on a couple weeks ago at a <clears> Beaumont <throat> PD, <throat> and his attitude after his critical incident was, I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh, and we had talked about it just briefly during his episode of, and your experience, and your the, to, to a listener that's listening right now that's in law enforcement and he wants to go, he, his buddy's going through an incident. Is there something or any kind of indication, training, uh, identifiers that when our partners, our, our, our family, our blue family are going through stuff like that, that you've seen and, and that, that person continues to push us away? Uh, is there something that we can identify within that, that realm that, that we can push on or that you that you've seen or that maybe some you're just a recommendation i would say get with the people that are close to home i mean it, it even the wellness unit um we are still we are still on the outside looking in we just met with swat uh the entire group of swat that they had in front of dr t and i kind of jumped up and said hey because it was at we at dallas pd just had had an unfortunate incident i said check on your people we are here but we're not your family your fam, you the SWAT unit. That's a tight knit group. They may kick each other in the, in the crotch all the time, but they are family. They may fight all the time, but they're family. They know. They recognize. Like you will recognize when Clint is, is needing help. Keep at it. That's what I would say. Just keep at it. Don't just throw a half ass effort. Like if if I call Clint and I get shut down, I call people sometimes and I get shut down. Well, then I'm like, okay, you look up some some of his cl- uh, classmates. Yeah, you you have the ability. Look up. Say who. Click go hell Godwin, yeah let's 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 get Godwin. Just I text Godwin and say hey check on him, but so, but I will say though, uh, Tyler that that some people you will never know. Yeah, there there's no indication and and you're left with a lot of answers if if it goes bad, uh, which it, it unfortunately has. But keep at it. Try different things. You're going to get door slammed in your face. There's always a back door. There's always a window to climb in. There's there's yeah. some way, and just keep at it and be persistent. Don't just go. Oh, I check this box and move on. To go get your lunch. Yeah, you know. I mean, that's that's a and big I part think, of it. I think by you, uh, your podcast, and we'll, we can probably segue into that here in a yeah. minute. Um, it, when I when I lived in Jefferson, uh, there was many probably many 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 times where I would I would just be overwhelmed with with emotion listening to your podcast because it was so touching. Uh, it's amazing. The what I've admired about what you guys are doing for a while now, 
ever ever dumb 21 year old when they're in the review board why do you want to be a cop serve protect and save lives well, all well, we really end up doing is chasing dope and putting bad guys in jail. Yeah. Y'all are actually yeah. saving freaking lives. Yeah. Literally, actually saving lives. And that, to me, and I, I'm fat 51 and more emotional than I used to be, but Same. that's that's the yeah. way bigger picture than than putting a bad guy in, dope, in jail for dope that's going to, as soon as he bonds out, he's going to buy dope again. And you're actually freaking saving people's lives. You know, you know I look at it as also we're giving – we're, I'm, my my goal was I, I was in doc, one of Dr. T's three day seminars and uh, it's up there in Frisco and if y'all haven't gone to that three day deal I highly recommend it. Uh, Heather Todell was first. She does a three day deal. Well, there was a portion of it that she has ten first responders up there. Ed, our ch- ATL chairman Ed Lujan, he's still active sergeant in Dallas. He's also our ATL chair. He got run over uh, three times by a suspect in 2015. He shouldn't be here. He should not be alive. Well, Ed told his story for ten, everybody got ten minutes apiece. And firefighter mix, some small town in, in far west Texas. Uh, there was an officer there that got a hellacious shooting, and, and he told, and he got shot five times, and he lived. Drove himself to the fire station. Jesus. But hearing these stories, and I was looking around the room of a combination of Garland, uh, Flower Mound, Salina PD, you know, Flower Mound Fire, all these combinations of all these. You know, there's some. There was, a, there, was, there was a lot of Garland guys there. They're all jacked and tatted up. And you, but I was watching everybody. Nobody was fucking around their phone. And they were engaged. I saw handshaking. And then it started up a conversation after it was over that I had never seen in this profession. And I told Ed on the next break, I said, I am going to start up a podcast for the ATO. Because at the time, I was a board member. And so I was, that's what spawned it. That's what th- that, that three-day uh, deal and that portion of Dr. T's uh, – presentation hearing other people's stories and i went that there's something there's value in this yep. this can be this can help people for our listeners dr t that's heather t- twiddell mm-hmm. and dina and y- dina is one of them he's she's got a, a chicago uh pd um a former chicago officer here he did 20 years there now he's he's here in texas up there in frisco with her uh robert um yeah she's got a team i think she has 17 17 different uh, counselors in the area. And she is also Doing her great work. Yeah. Great work. And they're some of our ATO counselors. That's how we got linked, uh, linked up. So you're, you're at Dr. T's class mm-hmm. spawn. Shit. I'm going to start a podcast. Yeah. What? I, I didn't know what the hell I was, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I was like, I listened. I listened we're, still yeah, to, yeah, I, yeah, we're still trying to figure this shit out. Well, y'all got a hell of a lot nicer place than we do. Our, our mine's kind of like potluck. I just, you know, I, I grab my shit in the case and go, but so, Start digging around, and I got with uh, Betsy Orton, the Dickey Foundation, who that Dickey's has their own podcast. Shout and out to Miss Maureen Dickey. Shout She's out a to, rock star. Yep. Huge first responder supporter and, and the Dickey Foundation. I'm actually on that board as well. We get protective gear for police and fire t- across the country. That's cool. You know, so it heart of gold over there, the Dickey uh, family. Um, so I start digging around. I start figuring out what works. And uh, anybody listens from the first episodes up to Chief Garcia, we had the shittier mics. <laughs> and what, what <laughs> your, uh, about what time frame did you kick this off? I started working on it. I went to Dr. T's deal in June of 21. By July, I'd gotten a board approval. I had to, pres- I had to do like a PowerPoint and everything to the board. And everybody was like, hmm, okay. You know, and they, they probably, did, you know, all right, yeah. And I didn't know if it was going to work. So August of twenty one of twenty, August twenty first of twenty twenty one was our first release, and it was at Lujan. And by the time we recorded, I had three in the can, which I found out later on is very valuable to oh, have, yes, have yes, back yeah. pocket. And yeah, we just started. Uh, had Ed Lujan, Misty Van Kieran, uh was episode two. They had U.S. Marshal Chris White, and then and then Misty became a, a co host. And I like having my friends on as co hosts as well. I mean, like and and also other prior guests too i think listen i think i think one thing if people start trying to make themselves a star or something yep. people notice you start taking a bunch of of, of gym selfies and, and and like and making it about you i think it's going to turn some people off and yep. I, and i when when somebody comes on the show and clint when you're there i, I brought in i, I wanted godwin there because y'all are classmates he was close and honestly he added a hell of a piece to it because he talked about a, a, you know showing up with a strapping young baseball player to meet with you but it also that was by design to relax you 
right? Because I get um, Matt Baines comes on, Will Chesney and Navy Seal. They're friends. I know if I have, I want you to come on with your cool ass country voice, but I also want you to be there as as his as his support as he's going through this. And I, that's what I try to do. I want everybody to be respected, to get their story out the way they want, and also you know it. There's some emotion. I mean, you first time you and I ever talked, Clint, is after Lance Crawford's episode. You called me up and you're like, "Damn!" And no, Lance is. That was a hard episode to record. If yeah, anybody knows I'm, Lance, it was – y'all Y'all heard the edited version. Sitting there with somebody like that that's not used to talking into a mic. They're not out hawking a book. They're not out – they're not a professional speaker. Yeah. And I think getting those raw, genuine stories out there from people that aren't polished, that aren't really comfortable, yeah. but get them out there. And I think it resonates with people. And I've been very lucky to have – I've been very lucky to have – really amazing guest but also i've been really lucky that they've wanted to open up to me yeah and i think the listeners the listeners have uh heard that well and i think hard ass cops learn when they finally talk talking can be therapeutic yeah yeah and i've talked to guys that have recently been through it that have just now started talking and i'll say is it not therapeutic well you know I did kind of feel good when I went and talked to a couple of buddies that one time or when I got forced to tell an academy recruit class and I talked about it, I, I did kind of feel better because I'd never talked about it. I think that's helpful. Funny story about Joe. Oh, no. I talked to Joe probably 20 episodes in, and he was like, I'm done at 50. We're doing 50. I'm done. Because this is emotionally exhausting. Yes. It's um, mentally draining. Um and it, it, that's not a sympathy. As I'm wiping tears away from them. Yeah. That's not a <laughs> not a sympathy, but it, it's it's emotionally and mentally and trying to put the best product forward you can. And I talked to Joe probably. And Joe, the reason we've been somewhat successful is is only because of Joe's help and Godwin's help because they had stepped off way before we did, and they were open arms. It wasn't like we were competition. It was whatever we can do to help. But Joe's like, man, this is really hard mentally and emotionally. I'm doing 50 episodes, and this deal's over. I'm done. What episode are you on, brother? <laughs> we just released 75, uh, or 75th episode, uh, and I have now, I, just before I came here, I recorded one with uh, great Gretchen Grigsby of uh, T. Cole and her husband. She's awesome. She is awesome. So now I have 10 episodes that haven't aired yet. Um, you know, so, yeah, well, now my next goal is to get to 100 episodes. <laughs> And then, yeah, I'll, turn and then it I'll, off. I'll then I'll reevaluate. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, that is it is real uh, emotion fatigue because you look at this. So the ATO podcast is not my full time job. My full time job is the wellness unit, and I will say that that in itself is extremely emotionally and draining. Because uh, there's days that I like come home and tell my fiance, I said, "Damn, I don't know how counselors do this. I get people dumping on me from two year rookies to thirty plus year officers that are just." And I'm and I think to myself, because I've been with DPD since '97. I'm like, where did, where were people going before? Nowhere. I, I re, we got people not just yeah. reaching out on checkpoints. We got people ringing our doorbell. We got people. I got supervisors texting me, "Hey, check on this guy." I think it's creating a culture of taking care of each other, and that's what it was designed for. So you know, it, a little over a year in, and having a, eleven people. And honestly, I think number twelve is very close. Go to rehab and put the put their faith in the city of Dallas. Yeah, the, but when I said I'm hard. jealous because you're actually changing lives, I think I misspoke. You're changing the entire culture. Yeah. And the cool part is, as you told me three or four months ago, that you are getting blown up from all over the country because people want your model. So you're not only changing the culture at Dallas. My dad did thirty four years there. I grew up running down the hall in homicide. I'm, I mean, I, I have a special, special place for Dallas. Y'all aren't just changing the culture at Dallas, though. When you have people you sit all over the country that want your model to copy it, shit, I highly recommend. I wish every chief had the intestinal fortitude that Garcia does to lead from the front, be unapologetic about taking care of people. Because all he's doing, the way he's investing in people, dude, I bet he has the loyalty those people would go freaking yep. charge the mountain and uh, for him. And I will say that under past administrations, I don't think this would have flown because they wouldn't have trusted it. 
and, right. and, and honestly, and or I have been and, too afraid politically. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But so I will say that all the, the dope dealers are arrested and all the gang bangers arrested and, and, and to shut down these houses for the poor old people that have to live there on that street and amongst the garbage that live there forever in South Dallas to help them. It's rewarding, but to help peers and, and me help somebody six months ago, see him in the hallway. Yeah. That's what, yeah, that is way more rewarding. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Gordon, I'm, I have no doubt you saved that young man's life. You know, a 50-year-old dude, he may have already been going to drink himself to death anyway or five divorces down and, you know, bankrupt or whatever. But taking a young kid like Gordon and giving him the rest of his life to lay out in front of him, literally. He just promoted a sergeant. He's yeah. now going to be a future leader of Dallas. And in, in any other department, yeah. they would have been like, dude, you're never taking you the promotional promoted. here exam yeah. the rest of your life. So. No, awesome. it's it's rewarding. It's exhausting. Um, shit, you got me, Missy. Yeah. So, doing this podcast, it was the the original design was to either motivate, inspire, educate. Because there's a lot of topics we have topical uh, episodes, and not all mental yeah. health driven. Yeah, yeah. We have a lot of doctors, but I love the historical ones too. Yeah. Well, I, I'm a history buff, so I love, especially Texas history, you know. And, uh, and but at the very least, at the very least. You might get a couple of chuckles from our stupid ass shenanigans, and it, yeah. you know, I try to sprinkle those in there when I can to kind of have some levity to the, to the, to some of the stuff we talk about. But well, I've wondered you know. where your sick perverted humor that I love is from, <laughs> and I learned it's Terrell State. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> you graduated I, I, from Terrell State. Man, I picked it up from there, and uh, yeah, it served me well. I, I got, a, I probably got a master's in. There's no doubt. No crazy doubt. memes. So what's what's the future look like? Well, I want, I'm going to I'm going to continue the wellness unit, uh, and and the wellness unit's going to be evolving. Now we're going into the fitness, physical fitness world because we just had um, we just had an officer just just yesterday pass away uh, from medical condition, and we're trying to we want the department to go wellness is wellness, whether it's physically sound, you know, financial, financial, you ever get with. Uh, financial cop i mean so we want to take a bird's eye view of everything not just everybody needs to see a counselor not everybody needs to pass a fitness test so we're doing some things to uh incentivize incentivize fitness in dallas and that's that program should be coming out very shortly uh probably before the end of the year that's awesome would you start going to the gym for god's sake man i know i need to i need to be a better example do for, the, for the <laughs> start doing some curls. that's all i do <laughs> in the podcast i'm going to continue my goal is you know, and my fiance know that I'm full of shit. But my goal is a hundred episodes. She's shaking her head. Yeah, she knows. She's well aware. <laughs> so my goal is a hundred get to a hundred episodes and then see where I'm at. But I've already got ideas past the hundred. So I'm gonna go Good. past that. Good. And having support of of, of, of y'all and man, I I feel like I seeing y'all's studio here. I feel like I record mine like in one of those uh, uh, hobo tents under under a bridge. You know, this is just incredible. Yeah, and I'm I'm just I'm I, y'all need to come on both of y'all to ours. I think it'd be fun. Yeah, that'd just be better because we have a face for radio, <laughs> so it's better we come yeah. on. Well, why do you think I wore my hat and wore it down so low? <laughs> no, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue my wish mission with wellness and and helping my peers as much as I can as long as I can do it. Um, I got 20, I almost had 27 years on in January with DPD. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I've, um, getting, getting married in October. I got a daughter, sweet Carmen. Congratulations. Thank again, you. By the way. Thank you. So 27 on how many are you going to do? I don't know. It will, we'll, we'll just see what comes, what comes my way. If anything comes my way, if not, I'll just ride out the DPD wave. I mean, I'm in a, if I'm Joe a, Rogan calls, you're going to tell <laughs> Dallas, Goodbye. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can yeah. It, yeah. Joe Rogan. Uh, yeah. You please call. Uh, the ATL Bridges of Divide. It's on Spotify too. I know you have exclusive yeah. deal with Spotify. Yeah. No, I, I don't know. I want to continue doing what I'm doing and make what I and what I'm doing now. I want to be better. I want to make it better. And anybody who listens to the early episodes and hear us now, I think it got a little bit. The sound damn sure's got better. But I want the mission to just evolve and get better. I'm not trying to check off boxes. I'm not promoting. I'm a slick sleeve. I never promote. I don't plan on promoting. I want to just keep 
doing what I'm doing and helping as many people as I can because that is rewarding. That's fuel. I, that's fuel for me. Well, I will tell you this through podcast, the podcast community. It's not really a law enforcement podcast community. There's really just a couple, uh, y'all, us, and then Catfish Cops really here in Texas. I think there's some other ones out there, but you know, the podcast stuff is, as as made me, got me introduced to you. Uh, and man, if I could sum up just anything about you as a person, uh, passionate, you know, you're just a passionate person. You're loving. Uh, I mean, my kid idolizes you more than he does me sometimes. So, uh, from TMPA standpoint, from my standpoint, from Tyler Owen standpoint, thank you. Thank you for making law enforcement better. Thank you for making our law enforcement profession uh, more passionate and more aware about mental health uh, and what you do for the men and women of Dallas Police Department within the out unit. But our listeners need to realize also ATO just doesn't do stuff within Dallas Police uh, it's it's really within really across Texas and just like Clint said you're you're changing the culture nationally uh, with the Al unit and your work there so uh, you know I, I hate to say this but you're a big fucking deal and and it and it it means a lot to me for you to come on uh, just what, a couple months ago you got recognized at the state capitol uh, for your oh work. dude we didn't talk we almost yeah. missed that yeah so I mean uh, man Texas you're doing Star. yeah you're doing phenomenal work brother so yeah it was thank you. Man, they, y'all don't know y'all don't know how much that means to me to hear that from y'all guys. Yeah. Y'all guys, y- y'all are y'all are amazing at the TMPA and what what y'all do across the state of Texas and the beyond uh, of being there and being having having TMPA in your corner. It's been around since the fifties, right? And and to have them in your corner and and have voices and y'all are the the voice of Texas, and that's for a reason. And I'm I'm proud. I'm you know, and you should want your friends to succeed. You should want right. them. I don't look at somebody going, "Hey, I will show you. I'll, I'll show you exactly how we did it." Yeah. That's what's it so. That is that is what I love about all of Dallas. So we've been working on a skeet shoot. Yep. I reached out to ATO. They're like, "Dude, we'll open our books. We'll show you what works, what doesn't work." Uh, when I reached out to you, I was like, I reached out to Lori Burks and I said, "Hey, we're not a competitor." Do you know Joe? She's like, yeah, here's his number. The minute, the second me and Joe spoke, he's like, here's where I failed. Don't do these things. Here's what's worked really well. Try these things. I mean, it's, I can't. And I that can't. does not happen within law, within yeah. our profession. That is not Usually common. it's like, screw that guy. He's not going to compete yep. with what yep. I'm yep. trying taking, to do. Taking the spotlight off them onto somebody <laughs> else. They don't want that. And so for y'all to do that, it's phenomenal. Those are people that are trying, they're doing Failing. What they're doing for the wrong reasons. Yep. They're trying to become superstars themselves, and and they're not. They, in my opinion, I don't believe they're focused on what mission they're trying to do. Right. And I never looked at when you when you reached out. I remember I was on the way to get sandwiches when we, when we had our first conversation. Uh, you just called me out of the blue, and I think I sent it to voicemail because I didn't know. And I heard, you know, oh shit, that's Clint here. here. <laughs> so I called you back, and yeah. we talked. I never even it didn't cross my mind. Oh God, I can't show him all my cards. I don't want him to. Well, well, you, you were literally. Yeah, why do that? No, it's stupid. He was literally sending me like, "Here's the algorithm of where we've done well. Show me the statistics of what we've done well, what we've not." And that was super helpful. Super yeah. helpful. I have three questions. Okay. What's your 27 years on? What's your very best day in 27 years? And what was your hardest day in 27 years? Try to make me cry here. Well, you don't have to dive in deep. Just what's your very best day and what's your worst day? Hardest. Hardest day was seven seven. Oh God! I yeah, mean that I that imagine. that's I just that that's a kick in the um, that's a kick in the crotch to to all law enforcement, not just Dallas and the state, uh, state of Texas. I would say the it's hard. You know, honestly, I, I very best day I'd say after I had I had uh, neck fusion. Crash the squad car, and then the week I get back from that rehabbing from that all the time, blow my knee out in training, and then getting back from that, getting back on the streets. I, I think that's probably the best, the best day is getting back to work, overcoming overcoming those injuries, and then getting back and uh, getting back out the south southeast, putting on that uniform. My third question: You said you're. 31 years old, about to be 32. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what would 32-year-old Joe King tell 7-year-old Joe King that admired his uncle and thought one day that would be kind of a cool job? What would 
What would 32 and a half year old Joe King tell seven year old Joe King? I would say do it, but also enjoy and don't, don't rush anything starting off. Enjoy the academy. Enjoy it. Yeah. Enjoy it. Looking back at my cl- classmates from 97, there's only like six or seven of us left on the department. I, I've got some lifelong friendships. Early years in Southeast. I don't work with the Mike Mata or Frederick Frazier or Pat Stars anymore. It's it's over. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Don't focus on the negativity because it's easy to do it in this profession. Yeah. Focus easy. on the fun, the, what the rewarding job that law enforcement is. Focus on that, and then that will carry you through the rest of your career. I think that's a great point. Dad did 34 years there, and he spent a lot of time hyper focused on. Well, when I retire, when I can finally get out of here, I think you make a great point. If all you focus on is a destination, you're going to miss the journey. And there's a lot of bad days, and and politically it's challenging right now. But as we always joke, it's the greatest front row seat to a circus shit show. It's a lot of fun. And if you focus on the destination, you may miss a whole lot on a journey that's pretty good. Absolutely. Well... You, I know you've listened to some episodes. I've listened to some. Yeah. And we got to ask some rapid fire questions. We're going to end it on that. Okay. What is your favorite movie or line from a cop movie? Your favorite cop car? And your favorite drink of choice? All right. Favorite drink, uh, old fashioned. I, li- I like a good old fashioned with uh, Buffalo Trace. That's, that's oh. one there. <laughs> your mouth's watering, Clint. Yes, yeah. sir. Uh, favorite cop car, uh, the 94 Chevy with a Corvette engine. Bye. Man, and then I love that joke. I'll, I'll say that the favorite, well, cop movie. My favorite cop movie is *Lethal Weapon*. And favorite line from that show is, "You have the re- you have the right to remain unconscious." <laughs> so that's and, a good one. You've been in Southeast. Yeah. I'm sure you lived that. One. Oh yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, but I have to say, *The Wire* is the hands down the best cop show, or the TV show ever. I mean, it's it's the most accurate. Yeah, that was a really good one. Oh yeah. Super yeah, good. I seen that. I need to watch Dude, it. we'll do it. it. It's all on HBO. Yeah, watch it. It's no, great. It's really good. I think you, know, you, you and I have actually had that conversation. I probably beat the listener down for many episodes <laughs> talking about that. But yeah. Well, uh, Andy, you got anything else, Clint? No, I'm emotional freaking right. I, am I need too. to go drinking old fashioned. Now. Yeah, I do too. Man, uh, good. again, I can't, uh, we can't thank you enough for coming on, dude. Cannot thank you coming off. My son wanted me to tell you this. Uh, oh, you mean a lot to him. He wanted me to end the episode by telling Joe King that in the Owen household, we always say clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. I think that's a good way to end it. Our listeners, please, if you haven't ever checked them out, please check out Bridging the Divide with the Joe King. Yep. That's his real name. That wasn't his stage name no, from Chip yeah. Yeah. The Joe King, King is his Joe. real name. King Joe. So. You guys stay safe out there. Again, we got the uh, Saving Heroes Place Gala September 23rd. Uh, show them some love. Hit that Facebook up, Biloxi, Mississippi. God bless you guys. And as always, may God bless Texas. We're out. Thank you.